welcome. Um, hopefully you all can hear me. Hello and welcome. My name is uh, Mark Shimamoto and I'm the director of Global Outreach Programs at AGU. Um, and I'm very pleased that you all can join us here for this very exciting science policy panel on food and water security. Um, uh, two notes for housekeeping. One is hopefully you just got this notification. The webinar is being recorded and will be shared broadly after. Um, so you'll have a chance to watch this on demand if you'd like. And two, um, there should be a Q&A function to help uh, uh, get audience questions um, and um, get some interactions with our fantastic panelists. So please use uh, the Q&A function accordingly. Next slide. So first, I kind of wanted to provide a little context of how this webinar came together. Um, in 2021, many of the societies, a lot of the societies you see on the screen right now kind of came together and agreed um, and voiced the need for a little bit more stronger unity and coordinated efforts to really serve our common goals and, and really leverage our common resources. Um, the, the group felt that a common agenda will help advance partnership activities to be more targeted, trackable, and ultimately more successful for the collective community we serve. Um, and I'm pleased to say that this is really a cooperative effort across all of these institutions you see here, um, where everyone really has this equal opportunity to engage and support, share and learn from each other on how these different associations are um, supporting the broad geoscience community. Um, and since its inception, the societies agreed to focus on four um, key priorities, which really bring us all together. One being supporting early career and student communities. Um, two being inclusion and representation in geoscience. Three, public engagement and outreach um, to really increase earth and space science awareness. And lastly, uh, advocate for earth and space science in global and domestic policies. And it's that last one that really brought us together today um, to really think about some science policy conversations that are essential um, for uh, sustainable development to inform future policy, et cetera. Next slide. And I wanted to take a moment to, to uh, recognize many of my colleagues who some may be on the call right now, who really helped to frame this discussion, identify the panelists, identify the concepts that should be discussed, um, and really felt that this topic, um, food and water security, is a critical uh, nexus worth discussion um, and bringing together some expert panelists um, to have a conversation and identify opportunities for the geoscience community to learn and engage with. Um, Despite progress, um, it's known that more than 790 uh, million people worldwide still suffer from hunger. 26% of the world's population lacks safety, safely managed drinking water services. Um, since 2015, water use efficiency has increased uh, by 10% globally. However, um, 2.3 billion people still live in water stressed countries. Um, and then most recently with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, world hunger did uh, increase from 8.4% to as high as 10.4% uh, of the global population um, after really having large advancements of uh, at least stagnation for five years. So a very important topic. We have spent a lot of time deciding um, how to best present this to our collective communities um, and I'm now very uh, excited that we can introduce our fantastic panel to dive a little deeper into this um, topic um, and um, have a wonderful conversation about these complex inter interlinkages and challenges. And really, we hope this discussion sparks new ideas and new bridges to enhance the work of our collective community. Um, as well as identify ways um, where geoscience can collaborate in policy. So first, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Vina Srinivasan, who is the Executive Director of the Water, Environment, Land, and Livelihoods Labs, um, which is affiliated with Cray University. 
Second, um, I am pleased to introduce Donald John McAllister, who is the International Development Hy Hydrogeologist with the British Geological Survey. And last but not least, Katie Kennedy Freeman, who is a Senior Agricultural Economist at the World Bank. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm so pleased that you uh, took the time to uh, call in, whether it's early morning, afternoon, or evening, um, and uh, be a part of this important conversation. So welcome. Um, I'm going to start with a few questions to kind of get to know you three a little bit better, but starting with you, Donald John, um, the British Geological Survey is kind of a world-leading geological survey and global geoscience organization focused on public good, uh, science for government, and research to understand our Earth and environmental processes. And with your particular focus on an international development, um, I was wondering if you could uh, describe some of the science policy challenges in groundwater globally, um, and what can we learn from the recent research? Donald, you are on mute. Apologies, thank you for that. Um, I wonder whether you could maybe just move the slides on. Um, I've got a couple of images to talk around. Um, but yeah, then that's, that's a great question. Um, so I'm going to talk a wee bit about um, two contrasting tales of groundwater in, um, in Africa and in, in South Asia. And um, hopefully by uh, talking a wee bit about these two contexts, we might be able to draw out some policy implications, policy discussions uh, further on in the, in, in, the, in the seminar. But firstly, I'll start off with, with groundwater in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so at the moment, ground, there's a lot of potential um, for expansion of groundwater use in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this figure on the left-hand side shows um, the projected use of renewable groundwater across the continent. And you can see really with the exception of um, the North African countries, Saharan countries, um, most of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, there's a huge potential um, to develop groundwater for uh, irrigation for domestic uses. Um, but particularly for, um, for the expansion of um, small-scale agricultural, agricultural uses, there's huge scope uh, within Africa uh, to do that. Um, the other thing about um, groundwater expansion in Africa is uh, it's potential is a resilient water resource. Um, you know, groundwater is a, a buffer uh, to, to climate change. It's, the, it's our kind of savings account um, in times of drought. Um, and it has loads of potential uh, as that resilient resource um, in a changing uh, climate. Um, and there's a lot of initiatives going on uh, in that at the moment in uh, Ethiopia, um, Somalia, the Horn of Africa, where UNICEF, the World Bank, are doing a lot of investments and we're working with them in those areas. Um, so those are some of the, the, the challenges, uh, so, sorry, sorry, some of the opportunities. But some of the challenges um, are around complex hydrogeology, uh, water quality, uh, particularly salinity. Um, and although there's lots of opportunity uh, to develop groundwater, for example, in the Horn of Africa, there are lots of challenges around uh, salinity of, of groundwater. Um, but also, also because groundwater is at relatively um, you know, most of the use of groundwater at the moment is for domestic uses, um, particularly in, uh, well, both in rural and urban parts of Africa. Um, but to, to scale up, there's lots of questions around, you know, what are the policy frameworks to do that? You know, what, um, what are the kind of policies that need to be in place to encourage groundwater development? Um, and so those are the, the challenges um, in Africa. And there's a big contrast with another aspect of my work, which is um, the work that we do uh, in the northern parts of, of India and then the Gangetic basins um, and Pakistan and, and Bangladesh, where groundwater development is a much different uh, phase. Um, so this figure on, on the right hand side shows um, a very similar one uh, to, to that for, for Africa, the use of renewable groundwater in India. Um, but you can see that the reuse of renewable groundwater in parts of India, particularly in Northwest India and central Pakistan, uh, is way over um, the, the sustainable level and they're starting to draw down uh, stored groundwater. Um, and there's lots of reasons um, as to why that is, but that's driven in large part by um, agricultural policy, 
um, energy policy, which uh, um, subsidizes um, the use of electricity for groundwater pumping um, and the use of um, crops such as rice and wheat uh, in those areas in, in Northwest India and Pakistan. One thing to emphasize is that you, the groundwater depletion is a major issue in Northwest India, but it's quite different across the Indo-Gangetic Basin, which you can kind of see in this figure. Um, but another th interesting thing about our work in India is India is quite unique um, in that it has very long-term records uh, of groundwater, plus uh, the, the development of, of water resources, particularly in this uh, northwestern region in, of India, has occurred over a very long period of time on a very large scale. And if we just go to the, the animation on, on the next part of this slide, um, so our, our, we've done, we've looked at, you know, groundwater over the last hundred years in, in India, um, and we found that, um, you know, policy uh, which um, led to the expansion of surface water irrigation across the Indo-Gangetic Plains has been critical in um, the development of, uh, of, of groundwater irrigation, but not necessarily for, for the, the obvious um, reasons. The canals that were built as part of that expansion of surface water irrigation have led to large increases in groundwater levels which by the time of the 1960s, they, they kind of peaked. Um, and that ex increase of groundwater levels um, actually allowed the conditions to develop groundwater irrigation, which has subsequently expanded massively over the last 50 years, um, to the point over the last two decades where um, we have huge uh, issues of exploitation. But the fact that the groundwater levels have risen, you know, due to these human interventions and these policy decisions, um, meant that groundwater was more accessible. So you could use surface water pumps uh, to expand groundwater. So I think there's an interesting lesson here, um, thinking in the long term about the implications of, uh, of policy development. And um, because you know, the, 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 the rising groundwater levels in some ways are an unintended consequences of this expansion of surface water irrigation much earlier in the 19th century. So lots of, questions and, and, and I suppose the main point there is just to think in the long term about what our policy uh, decisions are and, and what impacts they might have and try and think through the unintended impacts as well. Thank you. Thank you so much Donald John and I think that's really interesting too about when when even just science creation what could be the unintended consequences and then on the policy standpoint apply that lens as well, um, I think is, is really critical, especially in, in, a, in a world of uh, changing development and a changing climate. So thank you for those two perspectives. Um, and I'm looking forward to following up a little bit on that during the discussion. Um, next, um, uh, Vina at Well Labs, um, you and the team fosters research and innovation for social impact in the areas of land and water sustainability. Um, as the executive director of this initiative, can you kind of describe how you see well advancing science informed decision making and solutions for for water and other securities? Absolutely. Thank you so much for the, the invitation, uh, Mark. And I think that uh, I'd like to start with actually uh, referencing something that Donald just said, as well as one of the, uh, the questions in the, in the Q&A which is, uh, you know, just as we have two groundwaters in India and Africa, we actually have two groundwaters within India. We have the Northern Indo-Gangetic Plain, which is the uh, alluvial aquifers, which are massive and uh, gradually depleting. And then we have the fast responding hard rock systems of Southern India, which is where we are located in Bangalore. Uh, and we work with Donald and, and others at BGS on, on those systems as well. And they don't often show up in global groundwater depletion maps, but actually groundwater depletion is a very severe problem in peninsular India. It's just a different kind of groundwater depletion than the groundwater depletion in Northern India. But as Don just, Donald John just said, we do have uh, a, a, a problem of groundwater depletion in India. And the question then becomes, what do we do to actually solve that problem? So where we started with Well Labs and the reason we wanted to kind of brand ourselves as a research and innovation lab for transformation 
was the epiphany that we'd spent kind of 10 years researching kind of India's groundwater problem uh, and, and raising the alarm bells on the fact that groundwater is depleting in these different ways in Northern and Southern India. But actually the needle wasn't moving on the ground. Farmer incomes were continuing to stagnate. There was increasing number of farmer suicides. Our land was getting degraded and uh, there was no evidence that farmers were doing any better in adapting to climate uh, and climate change and variability. So what we realized is that if we aren't able to actually uh, take our research and embed it in systems of transformation, uh, a lot of what we did was just going to kind of remain in uh, in peer reviewed publications and reports. Uh, so can you scroll to the next slide? Um, so what we realized when we had this epiphany is that we have this problem of research kind of on one hand, having a culture of studying the past. So we were doing all of this analysis of groundwater data, kind of trying to understand what was happening with farmer incomes, what was happening with groundwater, was deepening our understanding, even in deepening our interdisciplinary understanding of these uh, food water systems. And, but we had a completely different set of people that were engaged in the implementation side of it. The CSOs, the large uh, World Bank and government programs, the, the, the government departments at, the, at different levels that were actually uh, sanctioning money for restoration activities through the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme and so on. And these two worlds were actually not speaking to each other at all. Uh, and in fact, it's what I would call the, 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 the researchers were kind of looking backward and trying to understand what had already happened. The implementers were kind of looking ahead and seeing what must be, must, must be done to change the system, but with very little dialogue. Uh, next slide. Uh, so what we realized is what the gap actually was, was that you really needed to have better connections. So we needed a lot of our research to actually get embedded in innovation of intervention design. So if we had had a deep understanding of why farmers were kind of not changing behavior, why you didn't, why you were seeing uh, interventions on groundwater, to groundwater depletion as being only supply side and not demand side interventions. All of these actually to, to address them would require innovation in behavior change programs at policy levels, innovations in new technology, new, new ways of ensuring that, uh, that farmers' decision-making was more data-led. Uh, and all of this meant that the state of the science actually had to feed into these research and in, uh, these innovation and practitioner communities, which were designing interventions. And on the other hand, once the implementation was done, the evidence generated from it should be going back to researchers and being uh, being understood. But on, in the contrary, we were actually finding many, many CSOs co co collecting years and years and years of rich field data, but they were just sitting in uh, on dusty desktops in villages and districts across the country. They were actually never being even looked at by anyone with capabilities to actually analyze data. And it was almost heartbreaking to get these uh, uh, CSOs from the ground sending us 10 years of farmer data saying, you know, we feel terrible. We collected this data on our interventions, but we don't have people who actually have the capability, the data analytics skills to actually analyze it. And so what we realized is that you really need much more dialogue between these two sets of groups, the, sci the scientists and the, the practitioner policymakers. Um, and next slide. Um, and, and the epiphany we had, which led to the development of well labs, is that there are actually structural barriers, and I won't actually go through all of these uh, in the interest of time, but there are two structural barriers in both, uh, uh, in, in both ensuring that program redesign happens, as well as evidence that is collected from programs actually gets uh, absorbed by researchers. But I'm gonna actually uh, stop by saying, we actually need new kinds of institutions that are able to combine and bridge. They, should, they have to be ground boundary organizations. And then we need new ways of doing research. So we're promoting this idea called transformation labs, where instead of looking at landscapes as landscapes of research, we look at landscapes as landscapes of research and transformation. So we wanna study the landscapes with the objective of transforming them to uh, and, and achieving impact. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Mark. Wonderful, and thank you. And it's really exciting to hear um, your perspective in particular um, about how you saw these multiple complex challenges as well as gaps of knowledge between the science system and the policy system, and you're working to bridge that gap. 
um, uh, it's, it's very commendable. And um, I have a few questions for you later as well. I'm gonna do a reminder too for folks uh, tuning in, please use the Q&A function. Um, we will have a Q&A starting uh, with the audience in probably about 15 minutes. So get your questions uh, in. And um, next, I wanted to turn to Katie. Um, Katie, the World Bank is a well-known global institution that works in every major area of development and provides a wide ar array of financial products, technical assistance to really help countries um, share and apply in innovative knowledge and solutions to um, very local or uh, global challenges. Um, you in particular, can you talk a little bit about your work at the World Bank um, and the work that's being done to address food security in West Africa? Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, thank you for having me. It's it's wonderful to be part of this panel. And I think the placement, the order of the panel works very well in terms of me being able to respond a little bit to some of the things that Donald, John, and Vina have just talked about. So as you mentioned, I work specifically in West Africa. It is a important place to talk about um, groundwater and agriculture. Maybe you could go to the first slide that I have, if you don't mind. So I just wanted to set a little bit the context. So in West Africa right now, we are in the third consecutive year of food insecurity crisis. And there are more than 41 million people right now who are facing acute food insecurity. Uh, there are multiple drivers of this food insecurity. Uh, in the Sahelian countries, certainly reduced groundwater is one of them, but we think about these demand side pressures, supply side pressures coming together in this interaction with conflict, uh, the implications of the war in Ukraine, some of the lasting effects of COVID-19, and how these are impacting many of the countries that we work with in West Africa. In particular, climate change is increasing the pressure on food production through all sorts of impacts, but in particular in Sahelian countries, access to water and groundwater. Um, in the Sahel alone, we have estimates that say that climate change could induce GDP annual losses of up to 12% by, two, by uh, 2050. So the impacts are expected to be large. The World Bank has started to do something that we call the Climate Country and Development Reports to look at climate related impacts and mitigation mitigation methods across all of the countries that we work in. And some of these uh, reports are estimating specific losses and specific impacts in uh, the areas and countries that we work. In West and Central Africa, uh, there is the analysis that GDP annual losses could underscore the need for people-centered approach to climate change and that climate shocks could drive 13.5 million people across the Sahel into poverty by 2050 if no action is taken. So in particular in the Sahel, it's critical that these actions, the policy needs to come together to um, have an integrated solution between land water management to improve agricultural productivity. We have a number of programs that are specifically aimed to address this. So one of the big flagship programs that exists separately in East and West Africa is called the Food Systems Resilience Program. It covers in West Africa, eight countries and three regional organizations with the objective of increasing the preparedness against food insecurity and improving the resilience of food systems in West Africa. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? So this is the framework of the Food Systems Resilience uh, Program, and there are three interconnected technical components which are aimed at uh, building stronger food systems and resilience through these regional organizations towards the countries. Uh, the first is upgrading digital agricultural services. The second is enhancing resilience through landscape management, increasing investment in innovation. And then the third is boosting regional trade through investing in infrastructure. 
a key piece of this is this sustainability and adaptive capacity of the productive base with investments in integrated landscape management. That includes investments in productivity. It includes climate smart agriculture technology, irrigation, with the aim of having community-led integrated solutions that uh, can help boost resilience in the areas that we're working in. This integrated landscape management is an important piece of the productivity. It's also an important piece of the community engagement. We do a lot at the World Bank um, related to specific investments. And this science to policy, the science to action connection is extremely important for us. And I say that um, to highlight an important collaboration that we have with the CGIAR. Uh, we have a complementary program to this Food Systems Resilience Program with the CGIAR, which helps to take CGIAR validated technologies, practices, methods, and translate them into on-farm and in community actions with farmers in the countries that the Food Systems Resilience Program reaches. This interaction that we have with the CGIAR is the first of its kind. The World Bank has always directly financed the CGIAR, but this program um, that, I'm, that I'm mentioning is called the uh, Accelerating the Impact of CGIAR Climate Research for Africa, and it is the first time that the World Bank has given IDA regional resources to the world to the CGIAR to complement World Bank investments in the area. This has proved extremely valuable and it has given us the confidence that the investments that we are financing under the Food Systems Resilience Program are up to date with the most recent science and the most recent research informed by CGIAR climate scientists. Um, and uh, we have created linkages across the countries through these two programs. The last thing I will just say is related to the overlap in terminology. So we talk about integrated landscape management within this food systems resilience program and the best ways to do integrated landscape management. We also measure the climate smart agriculture technologies, which are invested under this program and the number of farmers who are adopting climate smart agriculture technologies. Within the scope of our Senegal program, we have uh, recently partnered with the Global Environment Fund to invest in nature-based solutions. And the, uh, the question that we're asking now together with CGIA, our scientists is, so when we talk about integrated landscape management, agroecology, we're seeing that many of these are similar or the same. So a recent piece of work is to investigate the overlap of these technologies and determine where we can find practices solutions that meet all of this, these different terminology and work with CGIA or scientists to be able to integrate them into this food systems resilience program through this integrated landscape management approach. Um, so I will stop there, but there are many exciting ways that I think that this program in particular, but then the World Bank in general can collaborate with the work that you all are doing. So thank you. Thank you, Katie. And, and I think it's, it's a great reminder of um, kind of science in action, but also this model that feeds on to what Vina said about really um, thinking of it as a systems-wide approach to a solution and, and engaging multiple points of interest, stakeholder groups, et cetera, um, to really inform um, uh, uh, a policy response that addresses and will be adoptable uh, by communities. Um, so with that, uh, we have um, about 30 minutes to have uh, dialogue amongst uh, the group. So I'm going to ask if we can pull down the slides for now, just so we can see our wonderful panelists and um, engage in a, a conversation. Um, I have a few questions teed up. 
um, that I might ask to one or all of you, um, as well as, um, like I said earlier, please, uh, audience members, uh, submit your questions um, and we'll ask them live here. Um, and then, of course, if you have questions for each other, that is also welcome. This is this is meant to be uh, a dialogue focused uh, conversation. So um, I think picking up kind of on that last piece, especially with what Katie just said and how there may be some um, interlinkages across the talks, you know, when we think about science and science creation, um, we're learning more, more, you know, that A, science doesn't have boundaries and itself isn't produced in a vacuum. And so when you're working in other parts of the world, when you're working with areas outside of science, whether that be policymakers, practitioners, advocates, um, or just local indigenous knowledge or uh, community uh, viewpoints, um, how do you go about that process? And um, what are some um, effective methods or ways you've seen um, this uh, engagement or local capacity building really bring benefits to either policy projects and or research? Um, and I know Katie, you touched a little bit on it, but maybe we'll start with you and then others can um, react, uh, tr uh, contribute as well. And we may have lost Katie. I know she has a little bit of uh, a Wi-Fi. Um, so maybe I will uh, pivot over to Vina. So I think the 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 biggest challenge, you know, in in being able to, and your question was basically how do you work with a wide range of different communities who come from different kind of different mental bubbles, if you want to call it that, you know, they have different knowledge states, but they also have different interests. And I think one of the big challenges is how do you, how do you bridge, bridge that? Because, um, and I, I think there's a few different ways that we address it. So firstly, um, we're not afraid to take a position. I think that's the, that's an important thing, which is fairly different from what most scientists, most scientists like to believe that, we exist in a vacuum and we don't take a position ourselves. And uh, A, we, we are non, a non-profit, non-governmental research organization. And so we can afford to say, no, we we think we do, we do have what we call normative positions. We, we think that we want to do science or, or we want policy that benefits poor and marginalized communities. We want to be uh, gender responsive. Uh, we want to make sure that we're not uh, increasing income inequality. So we have, uh, we, we, we are not afraid to kind of take, not take our normative positions and engage with, with players that we think are values aligned with us. Uh, I think that is important because often scientists kind of like to, or, or feel comfortable with taking the position that we don't have a value position. Uh, and so we're just here to tell you the facts, but the problem is, uh, you're not working, when you're working in a transdisciplinary setting, which is different from an interdisciplinary research setting, in a transdisciplinary setting, all of your other stakeholders do in fact have positions and interests. And pretending that they don't exist isn't helpful. So acknowledging that people have different positions and uh, is helpful. What, what it actually then does allow you to do is A, it allows you to, to actually, uh, to work with people that you might not actually have prima facie have engaged with because you might be like okay those are big corporate players or those are you know somebody else they might look very different from you but once you realize that you're actually your end goal and values are aligned it actually becomes much easier to work with them it also allows you to say okay we're not never going to agree because we have very fundamental differences on what matters and so we're not going to actually these people are not people that we could eventually work with so i think having that clarity is really useful um, I think once that that's out of the way and the values and, and normative concerns are kind of out in the open and, and clear, then the science part of it is actually easier. Some of that, there are still some challenges. Uh, I think the biggest challenge that we found is actually in time scales. So scientists sometimes work in time scales of years 
And some of the innovator communities that we work in work in timescales of days. And sometimes that's really a, a big challenge for us to bridge because the scientists kind of don't want to put anything out there until it's kind of perfectly every, every dot is, uh, I is dotted and every T is crossed. And the, research, research, the innovative communities are very much long uh, of the philosophy that let's just try something and see if it works. And sometimes that's, that's a gap which needs to be negotiated. But I think the most important thing is once you've understood uh, the mind space that different people come from, negotiating something that works for everybody then becomes easier. Yeah, absolutely. Great points. Um, and, and it's definitely something I think we're hearing at least from uh, our conversations at the student early career kind of level of the global geosciences is this desire to um, think about how um, fundamental science can play more of an active role in, in this uh, transdisciplinary space. Um, so thank you for kind of laying out some of those fundamentals. Um, I wanted to see if uh, Katie or Donald had any thoughts as well on how, you know, um, stakeholder engagement, localized uh, input um, has been very successful or, or um, additive to their projects or research. Maybe I can jump in here quickly, Mark, if I could. And apologies, I think my internet is a little bit unstable. Um, so hopefully you can hear me. But just to say that we have, um, we have a formal channel at the World Bank by which we seek stakeholder engagement. So at the beginning of every program, there is a stakeholder engagement plan that's developed together with the government that needs to be approved by multiple different levels within the World Bank to ensure that we're getting input at all levels of design and then implementation of the program. There are formal feedback mechanisms that are grievance mechanisms, but there are also um, ways of engagement that the government plans to engage stakeholders throughout the entire process. Now, with any program, this is done well in some cases and not as well in other cases. And so in the programs that we run, in particular the Food Systems Resilience Program that I just mentioned, there's a huge emphasis on designing aspects where stakeholder engagement is necessary, where you would not see anything happening if you didn't have stakeholder engagement. And the integrated landscape management approach is one of the ways uh, that we are ensuring community stakeholder engagement and participatory planning activities for investments at the community level. Now, the governments where we work, especially in the Sahel, don't always have the capacity to do this deep level engagement with the communities themselves. And so in these areas, higher local partners, usually nonprofit organizations or non-governmental organizations to help them run these, um, what we call grant components of this integrated landscape management work where they are doing community engagement and then organization around planning of different investments by community. Um, that type of community engagement exists in programs that are focused on water as well, where there's a lot of community engagement around water points and the development of water systems. Great, thanks. I could maybe just make um, two, two um, just uh, additional points, um, Mark. Uh, one um, from our, our work in, in South Asia, which possibly touches a wee bit on them, um, what what Vina was saying about um, about you know uh, different organisational values and, and that kind of thing, because um, a, a lot of that work that we've done has been um, transboundary. So it's, I suppose an observation is you know working with uh, scientists in India and in Northern India in the National Institute of Hydrology, government agency, um, and on the on the Pakistani side working with the, the Pakistan Institute of Water and uh, Water and Power Development Authority, you know, um, so it's engaging with these these two groups, and you know, science there is a kind of diplomacy, getting people to come together and and talk to each other across across borders. So I think that's been one of the really interesting things about um, the work that we've done in in that context um, is the the role that science can play in just getting people to to talk to each other, really, um, that may not normally normally do that, um, and then. Uh, some examples of uh, from our work in in um, sub-Saharan Africa on um, 
on a program called UPGROW, which was a, a, a large um, natural environment research council, which is the UK's um, uh, uh, environmental research funding body, along with the um, Economic and Social Research Council and the FCDO, um, which was seen as quite a successful program because of its its engagement um, with stakeholders really from the beginning and um, making sure that, that stakeholders were involved in the design of that program um, and were involved you know, throughout. And then the legacy of that, of that program as well, continuing to gauge, engage with important stakeholders in Sub-Saharan Africa, like the likes of AMCO or, or SADAC GMI to make sure that the impact of, of that research, um, which was very broad and was about unlocking the potential of groundwater um, across the, the, the continent is, is continued to, to get into to policy discussions going, going forward. Great points, um, and and thank you. And it's great to hear at what levels, challenges, and opportunities you're experiencing um, by engaging um, broadly as well as locally um, to really enrich uh, processes. And I think that's something you know, just sharing those lessons learned, um, as well as um, helping to inform ways others can lead by your example um, is is very critical and important. Um, moving to kind of my next broad question, um, especially around kind of science policy, something, a framework we see a lot that many around the world are most familiar with is uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, um, which has very ambitious targets by 2030. And uh, food and water security is almost embedded across all of their, those goals, um, with a particular focus on Goal two, which is zero hunger, as well as goal six, which is clean water and sanitation. Um, this is a unifying framework that's meant to hope to uh, aspire efforts that lead to sensible solutions around um, these kind of multiple challenges. Um, and I know UNESCO recently just released a report specifically on geoscience and the SDGs and identifying those linkages. I'm wondering from your perspectives, have you seen any um, very innovative solutions or practices or discoveries really um, that um, contribute, whether it's locally, regionally, or globally to large advancements in this space um, to really show some of those co-benefit um, that maybe address multiple uh, stressors um, across the um, the SDG framework. Um, I'm wondering. I'm seeing a, net, a, a head nod from Vina. Did you want to kick that off? Sure. I think a, a couple of examples. One, I think, uh, is what IBMI has done with the solar irrigation program. Um, I think that's that's an example of. Um, of something that's both enabled ground expansion of groundwater in Africa, which is you know the two the two we talked about the two groundwaters problem, but in India as well, where over exploitation is a problem, uh, uh, kind of allowed. Uh, uh, so it's designed differently in India. In India, the the, the program is designed where uh, if the farmer is allowed to sell electricity back to the grid, and so at the margin, the farmer has an incentive to eat to sell electricity versus using it basically to pump groundwater. So it's one of those things which has kind of worked in the context of both the groundwaters, the overexploitation as well as the underexploitation problem. So I think that's an interesting technology come policy um, initiative that's 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 been uh, promoted. Um, I think another example in the Indian context is what has been done with the Millet's mission in a couple of the states. Because uh, uh, you know, if you think about dryland uh, countries like India, where groundwater is overexploited, you have many you have many parts of India where 30, 40, 50 percent of the farmers are still rain fed, even when groundwater is already overexploited. And so there's no real space uh, for expansion of irrigation in some of these places. They're closed river basins, groundwater is already overexploited. And you still have millions of smallholder farmers who are rain fed and subsistence. And so the only kind of pathways that you have out of poverty in those places where you can't actually expand irrigation further 
is if you actually increase the value chains of rain-fed agriculture. And so there's a lot of interesting work around millets, which is a rain-fed crop, and interesting combinations of growing millets in agroecological, under agroecological conditions, but led by policy and supported very heavily by civil society um, ecosystems, but ensuring that farmers actually get uh, guaranteed uh, prices for their produce and so on through, you know, the public distribution system and purchase guarantees and so on and so forth. So very interesting uh, uh, approaches that in involve the complete ecosystem from technology innovation to science, to policy, to practitioner, uh, to civil society, the entire thing. Wonderful. Um... Katie, did you want to share anything that you've seen either through the efforts of the World Bank or beyond that that have struck uh, or stood out? Sure, um, a few things. One is that we are not on track to meet those goals. So just very clearly, we are not on track to meet the sustainable development goals. We are not on track to meet the zero hunger goal. And that you know, is, what, is, the, is the guiding principle really of what we think about and do. Um, the second thing is that, you know, I second the solar irrigation technology, and uh, I would add to we're doing a lot of work on biodigesters. It is a niche technology, which is um, allows for circularity of different resource streams, including renewable energy, including water in places where renewable energy can be sold to the grid on dairy farms, there's a lot of potential for these technologies, but big gains we have seen through solar irrigation programs. The last thing I would say is related to the NDCs. So in addition to the sustainable development goals, we work very closely with countries on developing their nationally determined contributions, but also helping them to meet their nationally determined contributions. In Africa, we don't talk a lot about mitigation, but we talk about adaptation NDCs. And in the CGIAR program that I mentioned, this uh, accelerating the impact of CGIAR climate research for Africa, we recently financed a paper where we looked at the adaptation uh, NDCs in African countries and see that there's no consistency, there's not a lot of depth and that there are no metrics for measuring what these look like and are now working on a piece of research that I am calling um, a vertical integration of measurement for the NDCs for adaptation in Africa specifically, where we look at making some type of harmonization across the adaptation NDCs in Africa to be able to talk more confidently about what is actually happening and be able to aggregate some of this data at a global level. I think that in, a, you know, the related to the sustainable development goals, there's some more organization around that, but that still rings true there, that we are doing many things across many countries and the aggregation of measurement I think is not always perfect in terms of knowing what is happening and how to hurt homogenize the data across different countries. So, um, but uh, certainly the work that we're doing in solar irrigation is exciting. One last thing related to that though, solar irrigation to me is a no brainer, right? A low hanging fruit, an easy win, we know that this works. And the issue is that it doesn't exist in many places that we've still not scaled it to the extent that we would like to see across many places, even where there are groundwater reserves. And so I think that you know, there are different mechanisms, financial levers and others that we're working on to be able to do this. But I think even when we talk about different climate smart agriculture technologies, there are low hanging fruits that we still have not been able to deliver to meet these global goals. Um, and then beyond that, all of these other technologies which are not quite proven are still in the pipeline, et cetera. Yeah, I, I, I think scaling is a challenge and access to financing and, and resources to scale. Um, where there are opportunities uh, to to bring that benefit as a challenge. And to your point, too, about the NDCs, um, for folks on the phone, if you don't know, the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions are under the United Nations Convention on Climate Change Paris Agreement that monitors each country's mitigation and adaptation efforts uh, to stay below 1.5 uh, degrees. Um, Donald, I was wondering if, did, yep. Yeah. Um... No, I, I agree definitely with the 
with the observation about the potential for, for solar, I, I think there's really quite interesting questions about, you know, how solar might change the incentives for farmers in Northern India, for example, um, with grid, grid connected solar, as Veena's mentioned, um, and also the, the impact that that will have on reduction of CO2 emissions, because, you know, um, pumping for groundwater is one of the largest, well, it's a, certainly a, a very large contribution to, um, uh, both, I think both India and Pakistan's um, CO2 emissions. So uh, that's quite exciting. Um, again, I think in Africa, there's lots of potential for, for solar. Um, you know, I, I think there's there's a lot of interest in, in that, um, as, as Katie's touched on as well, particularly in, in, um, in the agricultural sector, but also in the kind of domestic water supply sector as well. There are challenges, I think, in Africa, um, th which are related to the hydrogeology. Um, and recent work that the BGS has done has shown that um, the constraint on solar is it's 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 the hydrogeology in, in parts of parts of Africa. So if you take a country, for example, uh, like Uganda, which you know certainly in the south is is got a lot of um, surface water, um, but in parts of northern Uganda, for example, where the hydrogeology is very very difficult, it's not it's not going to be straightforward to develop. Um, solar, um, because just getting the water out of the rock um, with kind of more um, standard solar technologies is difficult um, because of the, the transmissivity, the property of the ability of the, the water to move through the rock and into the, the borehole to extract it. Um, so that, that's one thing I think we have to be slightly cautious about in the development of solar and in parts of, of Africa, but certainly there is, there is a lot of potential um, for for that, um, and then on just another, um, I do a lot of work on on rural water supply, sustainability and functionality, um, and in terms of innovations, I think there's a lot of interesting innovations taking place in that sector at the moment. Um, you know, for a long time in in sub-Saharan Africa, um, communities were expected to manage their own um, water supplies through community-based management, and I think there's a recognition now that that's been quite unsuccessful when in maintaining um, access to water and levels of functionality. Um, so there's a lot of innovation going on in, in kind of management models for rural water supply. So interesting things like the Fundifix model um, and similar things that are part of the Uptime um, Consortium uh, within the rural water supply sector. So there's lots of interesting innovations uh, going on there. And then another one I think is on monitoring. Um, and actually monitoring is an interesting one because I think maybe there's not enough innovation going on in monitoring, uh, but it's an area where I think there is a need uh, for innovation. And you know, in the last year, um, we've had the U UN Year of Groundwater, and there's been a very clear recognition of the lack of data that we have in groundwater. You know, so we need uh, you know um, monitoring innovation to get that data so that we can understand you know this resource, which certainly in in sub-Saharan Africa is still poorly understood. And until we understand it, the risks. Um, for things like expansion of solar, you know, are are very tangible um, going forward. So I think that that those are my kind of main main thoughts on that. Great, and I'm actually going to have a follow up question with uh, you, Donald John, based on that last point. You know, the majority of our attendees here today, as well as the constituents that all these different geoscience societies represent. Our, our researchers are, are actively working in the space, trying to provide knowledge, um, trying to share or uh, uh, develop better ways to inform uh, data sharing, open science, um, collaboration, um, better observing networks, et cetera. From each of your perspectives, and I'll start with Donna, John, what are some of, what would be one or two key uh, research questions that is is fundamental to advancing um, policy at the the uh, food and water security nexus. What are those needs or gaps? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so I, I think it probably comes back in a way to um, to what I just said about the lack of understanding of of groundwater resources in in Africa. I think it's a very different situation in in South Asia. Um, but because, you know, groundwater, you know, it has been used, you know, it's been used historically in Africa for, for small scale uses, but it hasn't 
being used at this large scale. Um, and because of that, there's still a huge amount of um, uncertainty about, you know, the, the hydrogeological um, nature of, of uh, groundwater in, you know, in countries across Africa. So I think there's a, there's a need to, to better understand um, the hydrogeology. And, and I think linked to that, which is not maybe so much a research question, but it could, the research question can only be answered um, by building capacity. Uh, in Africa of um, African researchers that are able to do kind of fundamental um, groundwater research. And, you know, we work with some really excellent researchers at um, the University of Addis Ababa, Sefi Kabedi, and, and, and the likes of, um, of him. Um, so there is, there's some, you know, brilliant scientists, but there's, there's not that many of them for a very large continent. And so we really need to build that, that base um, to answer those, those questions. Wonderful points, um, and and certainly the talent pipeline is is critical in ensuring that the the uh, the the talent exists both within countries, but also um, longevity. And there's these streams to help build um, capacity long term. Uh, Vina, do you have any thoughts on on kind of core research questions that that you you're seeing or or need answers to? Sure. I'm going to actually respectfully disagree with Donald John and say we have an equally big problem in India, I mean, in the South Asian context in terms of we aren't able to close the water budgets in most of our watersheds. You know, we've been engaged with uh, with this creating a, a QGIS product with my team, Paul Jaltol, uh, to be able to see if we can actually use publicly available data sets to close water budgets. It's really, really hard to do because just the quantum of uh, evapotranspiration uh, flux tower data, for example, is not there. We don't have enough gauging density, uh, you know, to be able to actually uh, build models with enough reliability that we can actually, it's just the amount of data we have to calibrate, it's just too sparse. So I think that um, getting low cost ways to be able to greatly increase data density would be uh, valuable even in the Indian context. And I think the second problem, we were just having a, a, a conversation with other colleagues at BGS just yesterday, or with the Geological uh, Society yesterday, which was, we realized that half the questions we were asking, the answer was, we can't answer that because uh, the system is so human dominated in the South Asian context, because there's so many wells pumping all the time everywhere that we're not able to answer almost any question. If I ask the question, how much does rainfall contribute to recharge? No answer. How much is the extent of the aquifer within which we can actually run a participatory groundwater management program? No answer. How much is kind of the amount of subsurface flow and what's kind of the, you know, it, it rains here, where does the subsurface flow end up? No answer. So we're not able to answer almost any question in any circumstance. So I think there's a, a, a lot of way to go in, in terms of being able to actually do the kind of science-based decision making that we want, that we aspire to. And a lot of innovation in kind of reducing the cost of data acquisition and being able to deploy it at scale. Absolutely, great points. And thank you for your candor. Katie, last uh, remarks before we wrap up regarding the question. Um, I would say maybe three things. The first is just to agree uh, with Donald John on the innovations in measurement, that some of the work that we are doing with CGIAR is on this work of science of scaling. So we're thinking about innovations of measurement, but then also um, on how to scale things, things that do work and uh, figuring out how to make the scaling of the, these things more successful. Um, and then the third piece is around uh, the the terminology itself, I, as I mentioned, the idea that there's a convergence of the things that we're doing and that um, to be able to name them is to be able to use them. Wonderful, thank you. And we are closing out this session now. Thank you so much for uh, your uh, comments, your, your teachings and sharing a wealth of knowledge that's happening around the world in this space. I think, especially this last point in conversation, um, there's a lot to be done, but that's a great opportunity for our communities to come together, um, to support each other, to mentor the next generation of scientists 
and ensure that um, we are contributing um, from uh, the global science community as a means to help um, uh, respond or support um, some of these big, very challenging topics. Um, there are some questions still in the Q&A we did not have a chance to get to, um, so hopefully we'll have a chance to type those in or, or follow up later. Um, again, this will be recorded. Um, and in closing, I wanted to thank our panelists, thank our organizers, thank the task team members who helped to frame this important conversation, and point to um, a hopefully very happy Earth Day on Saturday. Uh, the Geoscience Associations will be releasing a joint statement that helps to amplify our voice uh, on behalf of our collective community in support of the importance of this moment in time every year to recognize uh, our Earth and our Earth systems and every part within it. Um, so again, thank you all. Um, and we look forward to um, hopefully having another one of these in the very uh, near term future. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much.